So will today's energy leaders in Oklahoma be able to make the transition to a more renewable energy future? Well, that is just one of the questions I was able to ask futurist and energy strategist Gary Golden. There is an aerospace company here in Oklahoma that literally began as a buggy whip manufacturer. How do our traditional hydrocarbon based companies here in Oklahoma, that are so important to our economy, how do they transition from oil and gas to the next big thing in energy? So transitioning out of your dominant, your historical product or service is always difficult because of the uh, uh, talent of the leadership orientation towards the past and the present. And companies that have succeeded in, in transitioning into a new platform have done it around uh, a, a new vision that is compelling enough to move the entire company. So I think for the hydrocarbon sector in Oklahoma to be successful in transitioning into a new energy model, they do want to preserve their role around fuels. So rather than necessarily going into uh, wind or solar energy, which produces electricity, I think that their opportunities are probably more oriented towards fuels such as biofuels, uh, solar fuels um, that allow them to leverage their experience in dealing with uh, chemicals and, and biofuel uh, uh, liquids. But it is fair to say that they will be transitioning out of an extraction economy? It's difficult to say. The transitioning that we're seeing today is one from moving uh, uh, from an ener energy industry shaped by extraction of fuels from the ground, whether it's coal, natural gas, or oil, to a world in which we grow energy above ground. That could be through a biofuel system, or it could be something known as electrofuels, which is light converted directly into a fuel. So in order for them to make that transition, they will need to bring on new people into the organization that don't have the geoscience background, but have a biomaterials uh, and uh, uh, nanoscale materials uh, uh, training. Now, you said electrofuels. Now, I'm somewhat familiar with fuel cells. Are they the same thing? It's different. So an electrofuel is the notion of creating a fuel, a chemical bond, whether it's hydrogen and hydrogen or hydrogen and carbon. So it's a chemical fuel uh, that breaks apart and releases energy uh, without biomass. So traditionally, when you think about biofuels, you have a feedstock of biomass, whether that's um, uh, you know, corn or soy or waste material from agricultural systems uh, that provide you with a biomass input. And an electrofuel uses simply sunlight to create those fuels. So it's a different model, but still part of the same type of growing energy paradigm. Visit with me, if you would, about some of the various renewable energy sectors that we are really trying to push here in the state, and the first one being natural gas. Sure. So natural gas is, is, has been the game changer in the global energy industry over the past few years, particularly around the uh, ability to extract shale natural gas at a reasonable cost. Um, the upside to shale gas is that it provides us with a cleaner hydrocarbon fuel uh, from coal and, 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 and oil, uh, but the challenge with shale gas is twofold. One is the life of a shale gas play, of, of a region that has shale gas, tends to be much shorter than traditional uh, oil fields. So take the Barnett Shale in Texas, uh, after about 10 or 15 years of serious development, most geologists believe that it has reached a plateau in its production. So while there is a lot of shale gas opportunity in the United States and abroad, the lifespan of these shale gas plays tends to be shorter. So I think the, the uh, first challenge is production. Second challenge with shale gas relates to public perception. We are only at the very beginning of this uh, uh, potential pushback and skepticism towards the hydrofracking, the, the fracturing uh, method used to extract this resource. So it's very difficult to understand how these different forces play out. Well, in this part of the country, we have no shortage of either sun or wind. What is the future of both solar and wind energy? So I look at the future of solar and wind in two ways. One is the use of wind and solar around central grid production. So using wind and solar to produce electricity that's fed onto the grid. Now, the challenge with that is that you're then competing with natural gas and coal and nuclear power uh, on their pricing structure. So it becomes a difficult to imagine high growth for solar and wind around central grid production. Uh, the long-term disruptive potential is in distributed solar. 
So solar energy that is not necessarily feeding the grid itself, but that provides on-site power generation for the end user. That could be the most uh, uh, transformative application of solar energy. And, and wind? Wind will likely be a grid scale uh, energy source for the foreseeable future because of the hardware and the, uh, the dynamic of capturing energy from the wind is different from light. So wind is likely to remain a, a central grid source of energy. What role will conservation play? So it's difficult to, to say that conservation will change the game. Uh, I think there are two types of conservation to, to think about. One is the structural changes in the economy. So anytime you shift from a manufacturing or an agricultural economy to a service knowledge economy, there's a conservation gain in energy per GDP, right, per output. And I think that's very important. Uh, in terms of personal consumption, I think that it's important that we encourage behavior around conservation, but also recognize that any types of incremental gains from conservation won't be enough to solve the challenges that we face in the near future. Now, many would argue that Tulsa at one time was the center of the energy sector. How does our state regain that? So it did, Tulsa uh, arguably lost that role as the energy capital to Houston uh, over the past 20 or 30 years. Um, I think if, if, if we were looking at a future in which Tulsa becomes the energy capital again, I think it will be around this notion of renewable fuels. Uh, it might also be able to regain that status around this notion of distributed power generation. So an alternative to the large power plant grid model that brings the, the power generation down to the local level. So those are two very large, capital-intensive uh, uh, energy strategies that Tulsa might uh, get lucky around. So how does a state that is so energy-based make that transition? with leadership and the right vision. So I think the what you need to see in the state of Oklahoma are individuals that are able to simultaneously uh, uh, speak to the incumbents of, of the hydrocarbon sector, but also attract the entrepreneurs that want to create the next wave of energy innovation. And I continue my conversation with Gary Golden on our website where I ask him if being a futurist means you can predict the future. <laughs>